Once again, welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. At that time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn your meeting over to Ms. Helen Tally McRae. You may begin. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen Tally McRae, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call. <clears throat> Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that although the content of these calls is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. <clears throat> Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Finally, today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Free Continuing Education, or CE, is now available for Zohu calls. Detailed instructions are available on our website, cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu, and will be given at the end of this call. Please spread the word to your colleagues about the Zohu call and this new free CE opportunity. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interest or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Before we turn the call over to our speakers today, we'd like to share some One Health news updates with you. Dr. Barton Barabesh, you may begin when you're ready. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Casey Barton Barabesh. I'm the director of the CDC's One Health office. First, I'd like to welcome all the new participants to today's Zohu call. We now have over 2,800 subscribers representing public health and animal health officials epidemiologists, veterinarians, physicians, nurses, and other public health practitioners at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as professionals from non-governmental organizations, industry, and academia. So thank you for helping us spread the word about the Zohu call, and please continue letting your colleagues know, as well as that we offer continuing education. To begin today's call, I'd like to share the latest One Health resources with you. These links are included in today's Zohu Call email reminder. First, National Pet Week is next week. The latest vital signs topic released by CDC is on vector-borne diseases. We encourage you to check that out. There's a new Smithsonian exhibit opening on May 18th called Outbreaks, Epidemics in a Connected World. So if you're in the D.C. area or traveling to the D.C. area, be sure to visit that. There's a new CDC video that explains why environmental health services are so important. CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service, or EIS, fellowship applications are open, and the deadline for submission is June 22nd. CE is available for the recent COCA call about the clinical diagnosis and treatment of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We've also provided some dates and information on upcoming conferences and meetings. There's some on vector-borne and water-related diseases, understanding the economics of microbial threats, the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, a fifth International One Health Congress, and a summer workshop on pandemics, bioterrorism, and global health security from anthrax to Zika. There are also some recent publications we wanted to share, including the May issue of CDC's EID journal, which has a vector-borne infections theme, 
There's an OIE situation report for highly pathogenic avian influenza. There's a statistical adjustment of culture-independent diagnostic tests for trend analysis in the Foodborne Diseases Active Surveillance Network, or FoodNet, as well as strengthening One Health through investments in agricultural preparedness. There are a number of MMWRs of interest, and we encourage you to check those out. And lastly, for current outbreaks, there is a multi-state outbreak of Salmonella enteritidis infections linked to pet guinea pigs. You can also see a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases available on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. If you'd like for us to share news from your organization or if you want to suggest presentation topics or even volunteer to present, please contact us at zohucall at cdc.gov. And thanks again for joining today's call. I will now turn it back over to Helen. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Barton Baravesh. We have three exciting presentation topics for you today. One Health and Toxic Cyanobacteria, Suicide Mortality Among U.S. Veterinarians, and Pet Ownership Increases Human Risk of Encountering Ticks. You'll find resources and links for each presentation in today's Zohu Call email reminder. Questions may be typed into the Q&A box in Adobe Connect. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question. If you're using the phone line to ask questions, press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. We'll have time for questions and answers for all the presenters at the end of the call. Just going to uh, briefly go over the overall series of objectives for Zohu Call. Um, this is related to uh, continuing education. So you see there, there's a, the first one is to describe two key points from each presentation, uh, describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to presentation topics, identify an, an implication for animal and human health, identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats, and identify two new resources from CDC partners. So each presentation will cover one or several of these objectives. So our first presentation this afternoon will be given by Dr. Elizabeth D. Hilborn. Dr. Hilborn, you may begin when you're ready. Great, thank you. Hi folks, I work for the EPA as an epidemiologist in the Environmental Public Health Division, and I appreciate the opportunity today to talk about one Health and Toxic Cyanobacteria. My disclaimer. So One Health frequently focuses on infectious exposures and infectious disease. However, I'd like to introduce a broader perspective of One Health and evaluating environmental exposures. Certainly, we share the environment with animals. But our exposures to the environment are highly modified. We build shelters, we modulate the temperature within them, we treat our water, et cetera. Animals, particularly wildlife, have direct exposures to the environment. So I'd like to discuss cyanobacteria as a one health environmental exposure. Cyanobacteria are actually photosynthesizing bacteria. They're a type of phytoplankton, very common throughout the world. They can produce potent toxins. They, their growth and uh, proliferation is favored by warm, stable, eutrophic, or nutrient-rich waters. They're certainly a nuisance for water managers as they can accumulate on beaches they also cause taste and odor problems and can put toxin in drinking water. They're nutrient limited, and once they occur, they can persist in the benthos or the lake bottom and recur in subsequent years. We are supporting their occurrence with our nutrient pollution. Our nutrients run off, they infiltrate, and they're deposited by dry deposition from the atmosphere. 
I mentioned they produce toxins. There are multiple toxins, and some are very poorly characterized. But here are four of the better characterized toxins. Anatoxin A is a neurotoxic alkaloid, and this toxin is responsible for many dog deaths, particularly in the Northeast and Pacific Northwest. Before it was isolated, it was just known as very fast death factor. And we see that with these canine deaths, as they'll be with their owner recreating by the lake. If they get a toxic dose from the water, they can be dead within the hour. Cylindrospermopsin is a nonspecific cytotoxic alkaloid. It inhibits protein synthesis, so it affects various organs. Microcystins are some of the most common toxins. They're hepatotoxic cyclic peptides, and although they are historically thought of as being liver toxins, they can affect multiple tissues. Satsotoxins are neurotoxic alkaloids. They're nonspecific sodium channel blockers, and you may know them best as agents of paralytic shellfish poisoning. There are multiple sources of exposure to cyanotoxins, certainly drinking and recreational waters. Cyanobacterial scums are attractive to dogs and to young children who will put anything in their mouths. Hemodialysis treatment has been a source of exposure when people receive contaminated dialysate. People take cyanobacteria-based supplements, and we're now giving them to our domestic animals. Aquatic foods, ambient water aerosols, and produce are all potential sources of exposure. So certainly I mentioned animals are at risk from direct exposure to cyanobacteria. These thick scums, they can drink the water or they live in the water. But they're also at risk from indirect exposure. When a cyanobacteria bloom senesces and breaks down, it consumes oxygen. Fish kills can be associated with these low dissolved oxygen events. As the fish decompose in these shallow bodies of water, it's the perfect environment for the growth of Clostridium botulinum. And it's well documented that avian botulism outbreaks can, antece or, um, yeah, can occur after these cyanobacteria blooms. So I mentioned people have been sickened from these toxins in contaminated dialysate. Recreational exposure is a common source of exposure, and drinking water. There was a large outbreak in Toledo, Ohio in 2014 when toxins entered the drinking water. Severe impacts on wildlife have been documented. In South Florida, there have been recurrent large cyanobacteria blooms. Manatees can't get access to uncontaminated fresh water to drink. Their food supply is contaminated. And dolphins are not only exposed to toxins, but their immune system is affected and they can succumb to infection. Last year saw a large outbreak among cattle. So a typical scenario is animals have access to shoreline at a water source. A cyanobacteria bloom forms, and unfortunately, sometimes the bloom is blown onto the shoreline. And if the animals have no other choice than to drink from that water, they can be sickened. And that was the case in Oregon last year. And I mentioned dog deaths. They're frequently reported in the media. And people go with their companion animals to bodies of water, and the animals frequently drink from the water. But if you look on the right at this dachshund, it's not only a surface bloom that's a risk. We now know that benthic cyanobacteria, or that that grows on the rocks at the bottom of a water body, can release 
toxic concentrations of cyanobacteria into the water. So we did a review of events where animals and humans were involved in cyanobacteria bloom occurrences. And we looked for cases where animal deaths or illnesses had served as a source of a, a warning a, a, to inform human health risk. We found that livestock, dog, and fish deaths and illnesses were useful sentinel events. We also found that the best communication among different professionals, water managers, public health professionals, et cetera, occurred in these small communities. People talk to each other there in large areas where each health professional may have a large staff. People tend to get siloed, and the communication did not occur. So microcystin is a very common cyanobacteria toxin. It's commonly reported, but it's also commonly detected because some of the first tools to detect cyanobacteria toxin in water were microcystin ELISAs. So it may be detection bias, but the 2007 Lake Survey did show that about a third of the water samples taken contained detectable microcystin. In Kansas, in 2011, there was an outbreak associated with microcystin. There were 13 cases of human illness, and seven of these were confirmed. Now, a confirmed case means that there, no other etiology was identified that was thought to be responsible for the spectrum of signs and symptoms. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. Preceding the human illnesses, there were five dog deaths and a confirmed illness. And the microcystins actually peaked late in the year. You can see there was a very large concentration of 1,600 micrograms per liter, but that was after these events. The monitoring started afterwards. We worked with CDC NORS surveillance professionals to pull together a report on algal bloom-associated outbreaks during the waterborne disease reporting cycle of 09 to 10, 11 of 24 recreational waterborne disease outbreaks in untreated water were associated with algal blooms that year. These occurred in three states, all at public or private lakes. 61 people became ill. There were no known deaths. The majority were females and less than or equal to 19 years of age. 59% of affected persons sought health care of some sort, whether they visited their doctor, went to an ER, or are hospitalized. Only two people were hospitalized, luckily. We saw multiple health effects reported among the outbreaks. Skin and GI effects were the most commonly reported with respiratory and nonspecific effects, such as fever and headache reported next most commonly. Again, microcystins were the most commonly reported, but it was also the most frequent tool used to identify cyanotoxins in water. Interestingly, in two outbreaks, a fish kill and dog deaths in one, a heron illness and dog deaths in the second, preceded the cases of human illness. So potentially, they could have been used to inform potential um, public health risks. So there are real challenges for health effect attribution to toxic cyanobacteria. There's a lack of provider awareness. If you go to your doctor with gastroenteritis after recreating in untreated water, the first thing they think of is not going to be cyanobacteria, but it should be on the differential list. We're seeing this more commonly. It's difficult, though, because there's a range of nonspecific health effects that occur, and we have no diagnostic tools. People are exposed to mixtures. So in general, documented exposures to cyanotoxins are commonly reported in the media, but uncommonly investigated and documented. 
Um, the health effects are poorly characterized. They're nonspecific. We do know that consumption of contaminated water is a high-risk exposure. And because young children recreating and animals are more likely to drink untreated contaminated water, they may be more likely to become ill after exposure. One thing that can help with diagnosis is that the onset of illness may be rapid, frequently within hours or within 24 hours. So that can help differentiate from infectious etiologies. And multiple health effects are associated with exposure, but we desperately need analytic tools, particularly for detecting toxins in biological samples. Now I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators at University of Pennsylvania, EPA, CDC, and I do need to give a shout out for the new NORS HAB surveillance system, OHABS. So this system got off the ground last year, and folks are collecting reports of environmental occurrence of blooms, of animal deaths, and illnesses, and human illnesses. And also want to acknowledge the state partners where outbreaks occurred. And thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hilborn. Our next presentation this afternoon is, will be given by Dr. Suzanne Tomasi. You may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Suzanne Tomasi, and I am with the CDC. Um, I am an EIS officer based currently at NIOSH. So many veterinarians have dreamt of being a veterinarian since a young age. They dedicate years to earning high grades and applying to veterinary school. Then once in veterinary school, veterinary students spend another four years of intense training to reach their goals of graduating and becoming a licensed veterinarian. However, high suicide mortality among veterinarians has been described in multiple international studies. In 1982, an all-cause mortality study of U.S. white male veterinarians who died during 1947 through 1977 documented the proportionate mortality from suicide was 1.7 times that of the general U.S. population. Additionally, a 2014 national survey of U.S. veterinarians demonstrated that one in six veterinarians had considered suicide since graduating from veterinary school. So when the 1982 mortality analysis was published, the U.S. veterinary profession was comprised predominantly of males who specialized in food animals or large animals. Now the U.S. veterinary profession is comprised predominantly of females who specialize in companion animals. Um, currently the eight veterinary student population is 80% female, so the number of female veterinarians um, will continue to rise. So the objectives of this study were to compare suicide mortality in U.S. males and for the first time um, look at U.S. female veterinarians and compare the results with the general population. We chose the time period 1979 through 2015. We also um, wanted to describe suicide mortality by, by occupational characteristics and describe suicide mortality trends during the study period. So let's go through the methods. So the data set that we used for this study was created by linking sources from the AVMA and the CDC. The AVMA was able to um, provide a list of all U.S. veterinarians who died during that time based on obituary records and life insurance policies. And from the AVMA decedent database, we were able to um, obtain age, sex, race, clinical classification, and what we labeled as species specialization. So that's the predominant species that this veterinarian um, decedent worked with. So with the CDC, um, we have the National Center of Health Statistics, which maintains the National Death Index, or NDI. The NDI is a centralized database for all death records um, since 1979 that are on file in state vital statistics centers. The um, 
data from the AVMA was then um, submitted to the NDI to match up veterinary decedents with death records. And the NDI provided underlying cause of death. So for our um, analysis, we were not able to determine a denominator for the veterinary population during our study period um, that would be needed to calculate a standardized mortality ratio. Um, instead, we chose to calculate proportionate mortality ratios, or PMRs, using um, the life table analysis system designed by NIOSH. This system contains cost-specific death rates of the general U.S. population. Um, PMRs for suicide are standardized by age, sex, race, and period. And a PMR value greater than one indicated that suicide mortality in the study population was higher than the general U.S. population. PMRs were considered statistically significant at P less than 0.05. So our results. So we had 11,620 decedents that were analyzed. A total of 398, or 3% of the deaths, were attributed to suicide. Of the 398 decedents who died from suicide, 326, or 82% of these suicides occurred among males, and 72, or 18% among females. The median age for males was 57 years, and the median age for females was 42 years. The majority of males, 80%, and females, 72%, who completed suicide worked in a clinical position. 75% of the decedents with known species specialization worked exclusively or predominantly with companion animals. Both male and female veterinarians had significantly higher proportionate mortality from suicide than the general U.S. population. Males were 2.1 times, and females were 3.5 times as likely to die from suicide as the general U.S. population. So when we looked at suicide by clinical classification, um, you, on this graph you see clinical classification and sex on the x-axis and PMR on the y-axis. Um, we Confidence intervals are represented with the brown air bars, and males are represented with blue circles, and females with orange circles. The highest PMR was found among female veterinarians in non-clinical positions, as outlined in red. Um, they had the highest PMR at 5.0. However, because the number of decedents um, was smaller, the confidence interval was very wide. The next highest was among female veterinarians in clinical positions that had a PMR of 3.4 with a narrower confidence interval. For those PMRs among species specialization, male veterinarians who specialized in companion animals were 2.7 times, and male veterinarians who specialized in food animals were 1.7 times as likely to die from suicide as the general U.S. population. Among female veterinarians, those who specialized in companion animals were 3.4 times, and veter female veterinarians who specialized in food animals were 4.9 times as likely to die from suicide as the general U.S. population. So this figure, we look at number of suicides by sex for each clinical or calendar period. Um, period is on the x-axis, and number of suicides is on the y-axis. During the study period, the number of male suicides represented with, I'm sorry, I went back too far. Number of male su um, suicides represented blue varied among periods. However, the number of female suicides represented in orange increased each period. Now this graph shows um, PMR over the calendar periods. Again, calendar period is on the x-axis and PMR is on the y-axis. Again, you can see the orange line represents females who had a higher suicide PMR than males, represented with the blue line during all seven periods. However, the female suicide PMR did decrease over the periods, um, whereas the male suicide PMR was more variable. So comparing veterinary suicide results to the general U.S. population, suicide statistics highlights the magnitude of the problem among veterinarians. 
based on the previous national survey of U.S. veterinarians, the prevalence of suicidal ideation is higher among veterinarians compared with the general U.S. population. Similar to the general U.S. population, female veterinarians are more likely than males to have suicidal ideation. And furthermore, the prevalence of non-fatal suicide attempts is lower among U.S. veterinarians compared with the general U.S. population. This finding, combined with a comparatively high prevalence of suicidal ideation, says, suggests that many veterinarians who attempt suicide complete suicide, leading to a greater than one PMR result. So why is this happening? The proportionate mortality from suicide among U.S. veterinarians is likely multifactorial and includes the following. So demands of practice, such as long work hours and work overload. Practice management responsibilities. Client expectations and complaints. Knowledge of euthanasia procedures and training to view euthanasia as a normal and acceptable method to relieve suffering. Ever increasing educational debt to income ratio. Poor work life balance. And finally, veterinarians have access to controlled substances like euthanasia solution and the pharmacological training to calculate a lethal dose. So, like many studies, this study has several limitations. First, our cause-specific PMRs are mutually dependent, meaning a higher proportionate mortality for one cause results in a lower proportionate mortality from another cause. Second, there's a risk for misclassification of cause of death on the death certificate. And finally, species specialization data was not available for all decedents. So, based on this analysis, we developed the following recommendations for key stakeholders. We recommend that they could use evidence-based suicide prevention strategies to reduce suicides among veterinarians, could work to improve U.S. veterinarian awareness of available suicide prevention resources, and finally, this showed that the AVMA's obituary and life insurance data could be used to evaluate suicide mortality trends and the effectiveness of suicide prevention activities. Thank you, and I'd like to um, may, or acknowledge those who helped me with this project. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Tomasi. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone that you can uh, an enter a question in the Q&A box if you're on Adobe Connect or press star 1 on your phone and speak to the operator. Our next presentation this afternoon will be given by Dr. Katherine Feldman. Pet ownership increases human risk of encountering ticks. Dr. Feldman, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to present this work that was conducted while I was at the Maryland Department of Health, um, along with colleagues from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Connecticut um, and New York Emerging Infections programs. I'd also like to point out that um, May is often um, recognized as Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Month or Lyme Disease Awareness Month, and so I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to raise awareness about tick-borne diseases today on the second day of Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Month. So by way of introduction to Lyme disease, um, which I think most folks are aware of, it's the most common reported vector-borne disease in the United States and in Maryland, as well as in Connecticut and New York. It's a bacterial disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi and transmitted in Maryland um, by the bite of the Ixodes scapularis tick, the deer tick, or also called the black-legged tick. It can cause um, multiple clinical manifestations, um, typically after uh, an incubation period of three to 30 days. And there are um, three uh, stages uh, through which the disease can progress. And just to illustrate that um, Maryland, um, as well as Connecticut and New York, are high incidence states for um, Lyme disease, this, uh, this map that shows you Lyme disease incidence by census tract demonstrates that in some um, census tracts in Maryland, we have extremely high Lyme disease incidence. I've been talking about Lyme disease, but it's also important to recognize that there are a number of tick-borne diseases, um, and um, some of those are transmitted by the same tick that transmits Lyme disease, but there are also uh, diseases transmitted by the Lone Star tick and the dog tick. And so um, 
all of these ticks of public health importance can cause um, these diseases or result in disease transmission. And so if we can prevent tick bites or be aware of how um, we encounter ticks in the environment, we can prevent not just Lyme but other tick-borne diseases. I'd like to introduce folks to the um, Emerging Infections Program TickNet project. Um, this is a uh, collaborative public health network created in 2007 with the goal of fostering collaboration between state health departments, academic centers, and the CDC. Um, and uh, activities uh, focus on surveillance, research, education, and prevention of tick-borne diseases. And then I'd like to introduce this study, which is going to be the, the um, backbone, essentially, for the analysis that I'll present. So the Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases Prevention Study, um, fondly called the LTDPS, um, was a study uh, designed to investigate this hypothesis, that a single well-timed acaricide, or pesticide, application um, applied to the perimeter of residential properties in areas where Lyme disease is endemic will reduce the incidence of tick bites and tick-borne disease. So importantly, looking for human outcomes, tick bites and tick-borne disease. Again, this was a TickNet project. Um, and uh, Connecticut, New York, and Maryland um, Emerging Infections Program all participated. It's a randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled trial in which um, households, uh, heads of households were um, enrolled in the study and then randomized to either an acaricide, a treatment arm, or a water placebo arm um, applied to property in late spring. And both participants and study investigators were blinded as to which arm of the study the, the household was in. Again, importantly, the outcome measures were human um, tick-borne disease illness and human tick encounters. The study was implemented in 2011 and 2012, and participants could, um, participated for just one of those two years. Hang on, guys. I've lost my advanced button. There we go. Okay, so this study was um, approved by the Institutional Review Board and all the study sites. Um, and data collection involved an initial phone survey prior to treating the property um, in which we collected demographics, uh, property and landscape characteristics. We asked about uh, whether the household had indoor pets that also went outdoors. We also asked about the use of tick control products on pets. After the property was treated, we then went back to the households and asked them to complete four monthly surveys that uh, provided us information on the number of ticks found on pets in the preceding month, as well as the number of ticks found crawling or attached to humans. And the final survey, which was conducted five to six months after property treatment, asked about incident tick-borne disease diagnosis in household members. And provided the, um, uh, we could get consent, we then would um, do a medical record review to um, confirm that uh, tick-borne disease diagnosis. Um, for folks who are interested in, in learning about that study, I'll refer them to this uh, journal article because what I want to do is then proceed to discuss the pet ownership as a risk factor for tick encounters or disease. So we know that uh, um, U.S. families love their pets, pet ownership is increasing, and that pets share the living space with their humans, um, including uh, sleeping on beds, sleeping on furniture, and there's concern that pets might bring ticks into the home environment. Um, back when Lyme disease was first being um, described, there were several case theories that supported this idea that, that people with Lyme disease had pets that went indoors and outdoors. And then Steer in 1978 conducted a case control study, and one of the findings was that the presence of animals, specifically cats, was a significant risk factor for Lyme disease. Subsequent studies, however, did not demonstrate the association, and it's possible that that was because of ina inadequate study power. So what we did was um, within our randomized controlled trial, we conducted a nested con um, cohort study whereby we explored the relationship between pet ownership and those outcomes that I told you about, whether uh, people found ticks crawling or attached to household members or whether there was a tick-borne disease diagnosed in any household member. We conducted univariate analyses and multivariable logistic regression, and our analyses were conducted at the household level. To give you a sense of our enrollment, we um, enrolled 2,727 households, which were randomized again to either the treatment arm, 
1,362 households um, randomized to receive treatment, and then 1,365 assigned to the placebo arm. And again, I just want to clarify that the placebo, um, they did get sprayed, but the spray was a water spray, not the, not the pesticide spray. In terms of pet ownership, of the 2,727 enrolled households, there were um, around 57% of them that owned pets. And so that left um, 1,181 households that did not own any pets. 1,010 households owned only dogs. 231, or 15%, owned only cats. And then 305, or around 20% of the um, pet-owning households, owned at least one dog and one cat. Now, what I didn't include on this slide is that 88% um, of the pet owners um, reported using some form of tick control. And there was no difference between the pet-owning households and those without pets with respect to property treatment, study site, and income level. In terms of the outcomes for pet owning households, 20% of the pet owners reported finding um, ticks on their pets. 31% reported finding ticks crawling on household members. And 19% reported finding ticks attached to household members. So I know there are a lot of numbers on the slide, so I hope to direct your attention to specific areas. So again, um, in the columns, we have our outcome measures, ticks crawling, ticks attached, and um, confirmed tick-borne disease. And then in the rows, we have our um, characteristics or risk factors. And so um, you'll note that pet ownership, including only a dog, a cat, or both a dog and a cat, compared to households without pets, were associated with ticks crawling, with ticks attached. However, there were no significant differences observed between pet owning and non-pet owning households with respect to tick-borne disease outcomes. And because having any type of pet explain the outcomes as well as each individual type of pet, we proceeded using any pet ownership as our predictor of interest. And so you'll see that pet owning households had 1.83 times the risk of finding ticks crawling, 1.5 times the risk of finding ticks attached as compared to households without pets. I'll also note that certain property characteristics also had strong positive and significant associations with tick encounters. Now this um, slide focuses just on the pet owning households. Among those pet owning households, finding ticks on pets significantly increased the likelihood of finding ticks crawling and attached to household members compared to pet owning households that did not find ticks on pets. And again, there was no association with um, uh, tick-borne disease. An interesting finding um, in this analysis was that the reported use of tick control was not protective against finding ticks crawling on or reported to household members. And then finally, the results of our multivariable logistic regression. So. Um, I'm going to focus on the, the top and the bottom model. The top model is ticks crawling. The bottom model is ticks attached. Um, the middle model uh, adjusts uh, those outcome measures for household size, but I'm just going to focus on the ones that do, don't adjust for that. So you'll see that after controlling for lot size and children's play equipment, pet owners were at 1.8 times the risk of finding ticks crawling on household members. And after controlling for lot size, having a vegetable garden, a bird feeder, and children's equipment, pet owners were at 1.4 times the risk of finding ticks attached on household members as compared to households that didn't own pets. So um, to wrap this up, this is the largest analysis by far that explores the association between pet ownership and human tick outcomes. Pet ownership of dogs or cats or both results in greater risk of encountering ticks. Like the previous studies, and despite our large um, enrollment, there may have been too few cases of tick-borne disease to detect an association with pet ownership. And um, interestingly, the reported use of tick control on pets did not have a protective effect on tick encounters. Now recall that um, folks reported uh, tick control use at the start of the study period, 
We didn't actually capture that in the monthly surveys or at the final surveys. And so the reported use might not reflect actual use, nor could we um, confirm compliance with um, uh, applying the product according to package instructions, et cetera, et cetera. So among pet owner and among pet om owners, excuse me, finding ticks on pets was associated with finding ticks on people. So uh, again, recognizing that the effect of tick control on pets is unclear, we definitely encourage pet owners to discuss tick control with their veterinarian. And as always, there are limitations. Our previous speaker mentioned the limitations. So data were not collected uh, specifically for this analysis, but as part of a randomized controlled trial to um, assess a uh, disease intervention. Data were also collected at a household level. So what we'd like to do is um, design future studies to focus um, specifically on this question so that we can identify modifiable behaviors and thereby reduce tick encounters. So we uh, recommend collecting individual level data, both on human and pet behaviors and on tick encounters. We also recommend verifying product efficacy and owner compliance with tick control applications. And again, I'd refer folks to this publication if you want to delve more into this topic. And uh, again, thank you for your attention. And um, please be aware of tick-borne diseases during Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Month and throughout the year. Thank you. Great. Hello. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Feldman, for that presentation. And um, I'd just like to remind everyone, if you have uh, questions, you can either go on the phone on start, hit star 1 and tell uh, Lisa, the operator, your uh, name and affiliation, um, or type into the Q&A box on Adobe Connect. So I see we had three questions for Dr. Tomasi in Adobe Connect. Um, one of them, if it, Michelle Waltenberg, if you'd like to re retype your questions, it's a very short um, question because we um, have a limited space we can see. So I didn't, didn't actually get your question. But um, so, Dr. Tomasi, I have two two questions for you right away. Um, the first one is: Have you compared suicide rates among other health professionals uh, to to those of veterinarians? So, with this population, um, and because we couldn't um, get a consistent denominator to calculate standardized mortality ratios. With PMRs, it only allows us to compare to the general population um, with this program. So we were not able to do that comparison. Um, however, that is one of the future goals of this project is to, um, if funding was available, to get a definitive denominator so we could calculate standardized mortality ratios. Um, we do know based on um, studies done in, in Europe, though, that have been able to compare health, um, other health care providers to veterinary suicides. Veterinarians were still two times higher than, than other health care providers. Okay. Um, so the next question is, are you currently compiling any data from veterinary students? Um, not currently. In this study, um, to keep things simple, we stuck to those um, who had had officially graduated and gone into practice. Okay, and one more. Um, is the method of suicide primarily by overdose, or does it vary? Um, it does vary, um, depending on whether you um, are looking at males in, the, in this population or females. Um, the big highlight with this population that I didn't include in the presentation, um, but will be in our manuscript coming out hopefully later this year, um, is that veterinarians um, are more likely to use poisoning than in the general population. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for answering those uh, questions. I'll check now with Lisa if we have any calls uh, and questions on the phone line. We do not have any questions at this time. Okay. Well, I see we still have uh, some more questions coming in. Um, the next one is for Dr. Hilborn. Uh, the question is, uh, what is nutrient population, um, which you said is a contributor to the problem? Nutrient pollution? Yes. Okay, so the primary nutrients associated with cyanobacteria blooms are nitrogen and phosphorus. These are used in agriculture, in lawn maintenance, and they're also, I mentioned the dry deposition from the atmosphere. 
ammonia is released from concentrated animal feeding operations and can travel for long distances and then be deposited as active nitrogen downwind. So there are multiple sources. Also, um, leaking septic tanks or improperly treated wastewater or um, sewage spills can be sources of nutrients for cyanobacteria blooms. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Lisa, do we have any questions on the phone? We have one that just popped in. One moment, please. So Lisa, um, question was about uh, suicide, and I just was curious if you had any speculation on the non-clinical um, suicides and cause or contributing factors, or if that was a real um, difference, or if that was perhaps just sample test. Thanks. Um, sorry, there were some technical issues. I only got the last half of that question, but I think you're you're asking um, based on the why the the PMR was so high for female um, non-clinical versus female clinical? That is correct. Thanks. Okay. So um, it kind of it, it comes down to statistic um, methods and um, looking at this data set. So as you noticed at the beginning, I said this data set was predominantly male. Um, so when you look at the veterinary population, um, Dem or demographics as it's changed in the last 40 to 50 years, uh, we've moved to a predominantly female-dominated profession. And so the females didn't really start coming into this data set until the mid-1980s. Um, so the males have had longer opportunity to become um, part of our data set. And that we um, saw that with smaller numbers. And so we think the, the higher PMR for um, non-clinical has to do with the fact that we just have smaller number of females, and repeating this study in um, 10 years or so um, might give us a better idea of what's going on between clinical and non-clinical female veterinarians. Thank you. Hey, I have another uh, question for Dr. Hilborn. Um, the question got cut off, but I believe it was uh, basically, what are the main toxins um, that are contributing to animal illnesses and death? As I mentioned, there may be some detection bias here. The most frequently used tool to detect cyanobacteria toxins is a microcystin ELISA. So if there is toxin present, that's the only group of toxins, microcystins and nodularins, that it will detect. We don't have a really good sense of the epidemiology of cyanobacteria-associated illnesses and deaths. What we do know is microcystin is one of the best studied cyanotoxins. And when people are really trying to chase down the etiology in a death, if they're suspecting cyanobacteria and they have the means to do so, they can submit clinical samples, um, stomach contents, stool, serum, urine, to a handful of research laboratories in the United States to get an idea of um, if microcystins are present or not. Some work has also been done on anatoxins, but again, it's at the research level with some specialty academic laboratories, uh, federal agency laboratories there are not good diagnostic tests. Okay, thank you for answering that. Um, do we have any other questions on the phone line, Lisa? We don't at this time, and I just want to remind everyone, if you do ask a question on the phone lines, please unmute before it's, um, stating your name. Thank you. OK, I don't see any other questions in um, Adobe Connects. Um, so. 
I think if we're finished with calls, uh, questions on the call, um, I'll just go ahead and, and start wrapping up the call now. And um, just want to thank everybody for their questions. And again, thanks to um, all of our speakers today for their excellent presentations. So um, related to the um, continuing education portion, uh, a recording of today's call will be posted online at www.cdc.gov slash One Health slash uh, Please bear with us as we're working through our uh, new system. It's taking a little longer than we had hoped. We hoped to get the recordings up within a month of the call, but it is taking a little longer, and we're hoping that time is going to um, get a lot shorter very soon. To receive free continuing education for today's webcast, WC2962-050218, complete the evaluation at www.cdc.gov slash TCE on, TCE online by June the 4th, 2018. To receive free continuing education for web on demand, WD2962-050218, Complete the evaluation at www.cdc.gov slash TCE online by June 12, 2020. So basically that means the, you can go online right now and do um, the CE for webcast uh, based on having seen the presentation live. Um, if you, uh, anybody who misses it or does it later, once the recording is posted online, you can do the web on demand um, version of CE, and you have basically two years to do that. So um, people can go back and um, check ones that they missed. Uh, detailed instructions for CE are uh, available at www.cdc.gov slash One Health slash Zohu slash Continuing Education. Our next call will take place on Wednesday, June 6 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information, please visit cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu. Please send suggestions and questions to zohucall at cdc.gov. Thank you again for your participation. Goodbye. Once again, thank you for joining today's conference. This now concludes your call. All lines may disconnect.